I'm going to continue with the, one of the great things about the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of the Testament. Continuing off where we was last week, which we're kind of we're kind of backtracking a little bit. The, the people of God, Israel, they thought they would go to battle, and they didn't consult the Lord, and it did not go well for them. And then uh, Eli's son. Hophni and Phineas were they were not good kids. Eli was the high priest, and Eli and Phineas were they were set up to be high priest after their father, right? And, but they were not good. They were wicked, and they were doing things in the temple of God that they should not have been doing. So the the people come to Hophni and Phineas, and they said, "Take the ark before us, so we can win the battle." And they didn't consult God. So what happens? They go into the battle and they lose horribly. And because of this, uh, the, the news gets back and, and the whole town get, is hearing it and, and everybody's hearing it and then Eli, it, how old did it say Eli was? Let me see. He, he was up there a little bit. 98. That's up there a little bit, right? But he says he was fat. He was a little overweight and he sat on his hiney and and judged at the gate every day is where he was. So when he heard this news, he heard of his sons dying, and it didn't affect him much. You know, the people, a lot of the people of Israel, they came to, came to Eli about his sons, and Eli didn't do anything about it. And he allowed their transgressions to continue on, right? But, but in this, he hears about it. Their son, his sons dying. He doesn't do anything. But then he hears that the Philistines had captured the ark. They had taken Israel's most prized possession for their own. And when, his, when Eli he hears that, he says he fell, falls off the chair, breaks his neck, and dies. And then there's more to that story there. But uh, the man of God falls to, his, falls to his death when he hears the story, the heartbreaking news of the ark being gone. And all of Israel mourned about this. So, But in chapter 5, I'm going to start with... Uh, Maybe a familiar story to some. I think it's a pretty amazing story myself. In verse 1, it says, The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Y'all familiar with who Dagon is? Dagon. There are video games. I didn't even know. There's video games about this guy. It revolves around you get to play this guy in this video game. Anyway, that's that is the the god Dagon, half fish and half flesh, half man, half fish. That's the the dress of the priests of Dagon. They wear this fish thing on their head. It went on the back. So, uh, but they walked around. But the the statue of Dagon that they worship, half fish and half flesh. What what do we call those things? Mermaids and mermen, right? It's in folklore and uh, uh, the the Odyssey. It's got you know several. Uh, Beowulf has got mer mermaids in it and and all these other things. But that's where we get that idea: half fish and half flesh. The the god Dagon. So the so the house of Dagon. They take the their prize they get from the battle. They take this and they put it in the house in the temple of Dagon. And set it right next to that thing. I think that probably kind of upset God a little bit. You know, I think it. I think it upset God. Number one, that that Hobna and Phineas didn't consult him. Should we go to battle? Should we not go to battle? Because you see that over and over and over again. Consult God. Should we go to battle? Consult the prophet. Should we go to battle? Should we not go to battle? Wait on the Lord. See what He says. When they don't wait on God, it doesn't go well. So they set this in there, and then verse 3, When they of Ashdod arose early in the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and they took Dagon and set him up in his place again. You know what? What's the Bible say at the end? That, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every will to, tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I, I don't think that's any coincidence that this... This Dagon character, this false idol, falls down on its face before the Ark of the Covenant. 
before the mercy seat of God, the place where the presence of God is supposed to dwell, the place where they go to consult God. And then this, this false idol falls on its face in front of it. Just like, I mean, you think about the most wicked atheist in the world, or the most wicked person, there's going to come a day where every knee will bow and every little tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You know, the, the people that are crying out in hell right now, they confess Jesus is Lord. They're, they're pretty sure of that fact now. They might not have been sure of it before they passed away, but they're sure of it now. So th this, this idol falls on his face. And then what do they do? Well, that must have been a coincidence. Let's just set him back upright again. And, and I imagine from, from archaeological digs, they, they find things of this, of this Dagon character, and they're huge, weighing several tons. And some of them are small, some of them are like life-size, but some of them were massive, huge, and they've got lots of... Uh, like hieroglyphics, engravings, and everything else. They even had Dagon in Egypt. That was one of the gods that Egyptians worshipped. The half fish, half flesh man. You know, Egyptians had a lot of that half and half stuff. Half eagle, half falcon, half, half and half. Yeah. So verse 4. So after they set him back up again, and they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Only the stump. The head, both hands, and only the stump. Only the fish part was left. But all the flesh part got destroyed, got, got cut up, got, got laid over. God did a separation there. God divided the one from the other. And I think that's pretty key because that's kind of what God does with us. Is that right? Whenever we come to Christ, what does He do? We, we, we are fleshly beings, right? We, we, are, we like to please our flesh. We like to do things that make us happy. And before we come to Christ, that's all our focus is, is on what, what makes us happy, right? What makes us feel good? What sounds good to us? What we like to watch on TV? What we, how we like to talk? What we like to eat? What we like to drink? All these things. Before we come to Christ, it's all about me, 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 me. But, but when we come to Christ, He cuts off that flesh part. And our desires change and our wants change. And, and what we used to hate, we now love. And what we used to love, now we hate. Because we used to hate God because we loved our sin. But when we come to Christ, we exchange that. And now we love God and hate our sin. Amen? I'm going to continue on before I go off that thread. We'll continue on with this story because it gets good. Amen? It's better than a soap opera. So the stump of Dagon, what was left? With the head cut off, with the, with the hands cut off, just the stump, just the bottom part was left. Verse 5, Therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. They said, we getting out of this place. We're not going through there anymore. That temple in Ashdod, don't go in there. Look what it did to our God. And, and there's, there's remnants of this Ashdod worship all throughout the Middle East. I mean, it wasn't just in Israel. It wasn't just in Egypt. It was up in Turkey. It was over in Greece. It was all over. All over. But he said, this one here, don't even go in that temple. Don't go in there. And it says they didn't do it to this day. In verse 6, but the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them. The hand of the Lord, God, is the one that's doing the destroying here. He destroyed them, and he smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod, and the coast thereof. How many of y'all know what an emerald is? Anybody? Bleeding tumors of the rectum. How about that for, for a little graphic? Bleeding tumors for the, of the rectum. So very, very bad hemorrhoids, which emeralds is where we get the word for hemorrhoids. Emeralds, hemorrhoids. Same thing. So God afflicted them with hemorrhoids. Very bad hemorrhoids. And so much that some of them died. Right? 
So the men of Ashdod saw it was so they said, The ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. And they said, therefore, and gathered all the lords of the Philistine unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried away into Gath. Who else do we know came from Gath? Pretty big character in the Bible. Goliath. Goliath of Gath is where Goliath came from. So they carried the ark of God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after they had carried about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. It's not going well for them. You got the ark, okay? You got, you got the thing, you won the battle. But man, God's not taking too kindly of what you did. You took, you took the ark, now your, your, your statues are being broken up, and now it says those in Ashdod and all the coasts, and now in Gath, God has afflicted all of the Philistines with flaming, boiling hemorrhoids. That's a bad day right there, right? Arts. Verse 10, it said, Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. It says, if they didn't learn, to say that you took it here, this is what happened. You took it to Gath. Here's what happened. Well, let's send it somewhere else. Let them share. I guess Philistines are nice. They like to share. Right? So they took it to Ekron. It came to pass that as the ark of God came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out saying, They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. Well, that's not very nice of you. Keep it to yourself, please. So, so they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to its own place, that it slay us not and our people, for there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city, and the hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with the emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. You don't mess with the anointing of God. You don't mess with the presence of God because it will not go well for you. And, uh, and in this, you know, they, they take the, the most valuable possession of Israel and they set it in their temple with their gods. So you've got a holy thing and a very unholy thing sitting there together. They put it together. And it's kind of in the same way that some Christians end up being. You try to put a holy thing in with an unholy thing, and what happens? I mean, if God's involved, what does God do? He gets rid of the flesh part. But in, in the midst of that, if, if we're trying to hold on to both worlds, well, I, I, well they say, I want to come to Jesus, but yet I still want to, I want to still be able to do X, Y, and Z. You know, whatever that may be. Or I want to come to Jesus and I, and I still want it all to be about me. You know, I'll, I'll go to church, but I still want to do this. I know the Bible says this about whatever that is, but, you know, it's all about me though. And it's almost like saying, well, I don't care. I don't care what God says. So we're trying to mix the unholy with the profane and the ungodly and the idols. You know, every time that it... it that Israel built an idol, what happened? Didn't go, you know, the story of the golden calf. They created a calf. They said, give us this thing to worship because we don't know what happened to Moses. He's been up in the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. What happened to Moses? And people can get uh, impatient. Anybody ever impatient? If you ain't raising your hand, you're lying. <laughs> Every one of us is impatient about something. Every one of us. And when we get impatient about God, how many of y'all ever prayed for something and got impatient, waiting for God? Amen. With both hands way up. Amen. I have to. I have to. Is that the way we're supposed to be? No, not at all. But if you turn with me to uh, Acts 7, that's not A-X-E, it's Acts A-C-T-S. Acts 7 verse 48 says, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. 
Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, but what house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hands made all these things? You know, David had to get special permission from God to build a temple for him. Right? In the Old Testament, it says the presence of God dwelt between the, the two cherubim. You know, the, we, saw, we saw in the Old Testament with the, the, the lightning and fire and smoke that was on top of the mountain where the presence of the Lord was. And so when God came and visited His people, it was a, a very rare thing. In this, in this it says, the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands. It, can we build a box to put God in? No. Some of us like to build a box to put God in. Let's build a box. This, this is all the, all the parts of God that I'm comfortable with. We'll put in this box. This is the loving God. This is the merciful God. This is the graceful God. We'll put that God in, my, in this box. And we'll close it all up. And that's my God. That's how I like my God. You know. And in, in so doing, we commit idolatry. Because we're, we're, we're slicing off the parts of God we don't like to make a God out of our image, we, the one we feel comfortable with. And we shouldn't be guilty of taking off one part of, in part, taking one part off and taking off the other. We, uh, in Bible study the other day, we use a, a good example that, uh, like, you say, have you, have you met, have you met Chris? And you would say, yeah, I know Chris, I know Chris. Well, are we talking about the same Chris? So this, this Chris, he's about six foot five, wears glasses, has long blonde hair, and a pretty stocky guy. I said, oh, no, my Chris is, you know, he's about 5'3", a short little guy, has, he's bald-headed. Are we talking about the same Chris? No, not at all. And in the same way, when some people describe the God that they've made this box into this box, and they're describing their God, and they leave off all this, well, it doesn't match this God, the one that's found in here. Because the God, God of the Bible, yes, He is merciful. Yes, He is loving. Yes, He is gracious. But He's also a God of wrath. He's also a God of vengeance. And He's also a God that has rules to abide by. You just, you just can't say, okay, I believe in God and go on willy-nilly living however you think is best for you. Because God has a standard. And because He's God, He sets the standard and we don't. You know, we, I, I, I'm guilty I used to set my own standard. I, these are my rules. Don't you dare tell me to go against my rules. My rules are for me and your rules are for you. You just live however you want, I'll live however I want. And we'll just go on about their, their, my day. That doesn't work with God. God sets a standard, we don't set the standard. So in, uh, in Acts 17, verse 24, it reminds me of another verse that's in, in the Bible, you don't have to turn there, but it says, my God dwells in heaven and does as He pleases. And that's a great verse. You say, why God? Why would you do that? Why would you do it? Well, God, he, well, He's God. And He does as He pleases. Right? But here in, in Acts 17, verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Dwells not in temples made with hands. You know that we, we read about the, the temple in Jerusalem, and you know there's the the what, what's the name of it? I can't remember. The the they wanted to rebuild the temple. You know they got all this money raised to rebuild the temple, and they've got all the all the artifacts for the temple that have been remade or or found or or whatever it is, and they're going to do that because that's where God dwells to them. You know that God is just as holy right here as He was with you this morning in the shower? You know, God, God is as present here as He is, hid, is with you when you're asleep in bed? The, the presence of God, God is omnipresent. That means He is everywhere at all times. And He's not more holy there than He is there. He's not more slack in His promises here than He is there. God is holy no matter where you are, God is. You know, there's a, there's a few places in the Bible where they tried to run from God. Jonah being a good one. Could Jonah run from God? No. No. He caught up with it. And he shouldn't do that. In, uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3. 
Because those last two scriptures, they had one thing in common. They said, God does not dwell in temples made with human hands. Right? You, you can't make a box to store God in. You can't make a building and that's where God's going to dwell. You can't do that. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Who is the ye? Yeah, if you are a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, you take God's Word, you apply it, you believe it, you are a child of the Most High God, you believe that, then you're a ye in here. Right? If you've been saved, set free, and born again, you are a ye. You are who this is right. This is being written to. Ye, know ye not that ye are the temple of God. It's not about bricks. It's not about gold. It's not about being being lavish. And you know, you read you read about the temple of God, man, the gold that went into that is unreal. Well, we are the temple of God. We are we are God's most prized possessions. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And then there, people really like that verse. We love that verse, right? Absolutely, man, that's a good verse. I'm the temple of God. Praise God. Woo. I feel good about myself. Thank you, Jesus. And then verse 17 kind of humbles us a little bit, doesn't it? He said, if any man defile the temple of God, which we are, right? Him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Right? So if you are a believer, if you are... In essence, the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you. It says, if any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. That's, that's kind of harsh. Kind of harsh, but it doesn't change it as being truth, right? So if, if we are the temple of God, what should we do? Make it holy. Make it precious. Don't count it as a, a very nonchalant thing. It's something that we don't take much thought about. Or our, our dealings. Is, do you need to think about it? Have it on the front part of your mind. Is that, wow, I'm the temple of God. I shouldn't be there. I shouldn't do that. I'm the temple of God. And it's not, it's not that you run around saying, I'm the temple of God. I'm the temple of God. Look at me. I'm the temple of God. That's not what it's about. It's not a bragging thing. It's a life-changing thing. God, we know for a fact that God died for our sins. To, make, to die for us so that we can have a relationship with God. To take away that sin for which we couldn't make a sacrifice for. We couldn't erase it. He died so we could have communion with Him together. There in instance, we become the temple of the Most High God. And then in... In 2 Corinthians 6, a dear friend messaged me about these scriptures there. And, and uh, sometimes these are hard to deal with. Sometimes the Word of God, God is uh, something you need to pray about if you don't understand it. If there's a word you don't understand, you don't just skip over it. Go get a dictionary. Learn what it means. Emirates. Now you know, emirates are not a good thing. All right. <laughs> so I went to the dictionary for you. Okay. So uh, if... 2 Corinthians 6, starting with verse 14, says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? For what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? For what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Woo! Power pack scriptures. Power pack scriptures. He's talking to the... the, the Context of 2 Corinthians is they've got a, a blended church. 
right? They've got unbelievers with the believers, and, and people that are calling themselves believers are, are doing abominable things. And, and back in 1 Corinthians, they, they said, the, you've got you know, a lot of sin in the church in so much that you've got a guy that is sleeping with his father's wife. It's an abominable thing. And there's ways to deal with that. And they, they've neglected the, the correction in the church. The way God has set forth for the body of Christ to work towards purification, to make themselves holier. The sanctification process, right? So be not unequally yoked together with believers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Shouldn't be any. That's a question. But the answer is none. Shouldn't have anything to do with it. And what concord, what agreement has Christ with Belial, with Baal? Or what part he that believeth with an infidel? We don't have anything in common. Right? God has called for His people to be a pure church. And, and it says, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And he says it again, for ye are the temple of the living God. We go back to back to 1 Samuel 6 where it talks about Dagon, the temple of Dagon who gets the Ark of the Covenant, the, the anointing, the very presence of God put in there with it. And God wouldn't stand for it. And in the same way, if we are calling ourselves believers, calling ourselves follower, followers of Christ, if we have that blessed assurance we sang about earlier, and we know and we trust Jesus is who He said He is, He did what He said He was going to do, and He's coming back again. We believe that. And we trust in that. If that, if that fact is true to us, and that does something to us, we, we, we can't no longer be that wishy-washy, what they say, if you're riding a fence, the devil owns the fence, and all you get is splinters. Yeah. So don't be riding the fence because it, Scripture is clear. There, there's nothing in common here with Christ and Baal. There's no, nothing in common. You're try, we, we are guilty. I say we. We are guilty of sticking an idol in God's house, in God's temple. And it's only the one way or the other. It says so we can put God's, God's anointing into an old dirty temple. And what John 3, 7 says, marvel not at this, you must be born again. That's, that's the part of, of God and His presence and, his, and the knowledge of God, coming, the holiness of God coming into an old dirty me, this filthy me, and God won't stand for me to stay filthy if His presence is coming in. He's going to cut off all the flesh part. He's going to cut off all the junk. He's going to cut off all the stuff that doesn't look like Him. That's not a reflection of Him. When we look in the mirror, we shouldn't see us. We should see a child of the Most High God. When we look at our life, we shouldn't see something that looks just like the world, acts like the world, talks like the world. We should see somebody that is a reflection of the Most High God. Amen? But he says, What agreement hath the temple of God, verse 16, with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then he has the commandment here. Because he's talking about it. He's getting on to them for being unequally yoked. And he says, Come out from among them and be separate. You know, if, if you're a believer and follower of Christ and you're in the company of people who call themselves believers and followers of Christ, but yet they're pretty mediocre at the least. Maybe they're what they call a, a Christian in name only. Or a, a sino. <laughs> you know, they have rhinos, Republican in name only, but a Christian in name only. You know, a sino. That they profess Christ. Jesus quoting Isaiah, he says, with their lips they profess me, but their heart is far from me. And we shouldn't be like those people. But, but when you get a, well they said that, that bad company corrupts good morals. So that's who you surround yourself with. What's going to happen? If you're up here 
And when it walks down here, either uh, the, uh, the analogy of a, a thermostat and a thermometer. If you've ever heard that before, what's a thermostat do? There's one on the wall over there. That's a thermostat. It regulates the temperature of the room, right? But what's a thermometer do? It measures the temp temperature of the room. The, the thermometer is governed by the room, right? And if we are thermometers, then we're governed by the people that we are around, right? That's, that's where the people, the, the, the word hypocrite means uh, people that wear different masks for different situations. So if, if, you can, if you can become the good Christian person here, and then when you get to that crowd, you kind of assimilate, and you become that, per, that crowd. And when you, when you get around another crowd, you become that crowd. And that's, that's you being a thermometer. That's not God's design. God's design is for you to be a thermostat. God's design is for you when you come into a situation, when you come into a crowd of people, when you get around somebody that's, that's down here, maybe they are one of them Christians in name only. When you come in their presence, the presence of God should come with you. He says, he says I will walk in them. I will dwell with them. I will be their God and I, they will be my people. So if, if God's in you and God's walking with you, when you come into a place where... It's not quite to the standard that God would like it to be. And if you're full of the Spirit of God, walking in God, you're the thermostat. And you bring the situation up. You bring the crowd up. You, you bring cl people closer to God. Now, it depends on where we are in our walk with God, whether which one we are, right? A, a, a newborn baby in Christ is not going to be a thermostat. You're still a thermometer. So you got to watch where you go. You got to watch your, who you're around with. You got to watch uh, people don't drag you back down. In uh, 2 Corinthians 7 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. This is talking to you. It's talking to me too. Amen. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, that's, that's, that's us, let us cleanse ourselves from some filthiness of the flesh. Oh no, that ain't what it says, is it? No. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You being the temple of God, if, you, if you've got a Dagon set up where it shouldn't be, cut it off, break it down, cast it out. If you've got anything in your life that you know doesn't please God, break that idol down. Take care of it. Take a big old sledgehammer to it and break it down, no matter what it might be. God gives you the strength. If He says, I will drill in them and I will walk in them, that's the strength of God helping you to do what is impossible to anyone that doesn't know God. But it's having therefore these promises I, I would say, I know it's a little more specific, but having therefore these promises from the end of the beginning to the amen and the end of Revelation, these are all the promises of God. And it says the promises of God are yes and amen. Yes and amen. So if we have these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. And take an account... You know, when you, when you go to God in prayer, it says, God, help me. God, I can't do this on my own. Lord God, I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried, and I can't do this. So I need your strength, God. Because too often we, we are impatient with the Lord, and we try to do things under our own power, outside of His grace, outside of His mercy, outside of dwelling in His Spirit. But if we are sincere and go to the Lord and say, God, I need you and I need your help. I cannot do it without it. And you make your mind up to that fact. Then no matter what idol is set up, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what trial that you're facing, God is there because He's in you. Not because you go to a place that may be more holy than another place. But you're the temple of God. 
and he will help you to cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. So be the bearer of the Ark of the Anointing. You are it.